so uh, I was a lucky sucker. Greg Simpson that uh, worked for Dr. Henry called me and said, hey, would you like to do it? When he told me the price was free, all you guys paid for it, and by the way, I appreciate your tax money. <laughs> so we had, uh, we had variable response, but uh, we worked through an issue this, this morning while we were standing here going over finalizing a slideshow. I think we worked through one of our issues, and we'll get to that in a minute. Uh, Cock and Stone Farms was started in 37 when Papaw came down there with the mules, literally the mules in the swamp in the crosscut saw. And uh, my dad came along in 55, and I'm Ray Stone, Northeast Arkansas, Walnut Ridge. I've got several friends here. My wife's here. My business partner is here, Blake Cox. And uh, welcome, guys. There's us. That's uh, me and my son, Ben, and Blake and his son, Matthew. Uh, 4,500 acres. Generally 3,000 acres of rice. Probably a, typically 1,000 acres of medium and the rest long. And soybeans and only getting your corn game when, uh, when the price is good. And just a few cows just to, uh, to worry over. All right, two rules that my daddy told me. Water won't run uphill and rice won't grow up without water. Does that sound like what your daddy taught you? All right, do these two rules still apply? We found out by road rice farming that they really do apply. If you want to find out just how much rice needs water, you just have a bad row. And uh, if it rains on a soybean, if it rains a lot, you might make 70 bushels. If you don't get that water right, on your row, row water rice, especially after the boot, you won't make anything, as in nothing. Plus, if it's a variety, you get blast lesion, you get to spray the whole field. So that's just a little bonus point. You may not even get a yield return on that spray. What about the tailwater pump? We put it on a short 40 in front of my house, had Rice Tech 760. The particulars is 05 silt loan. This field's got a sandy hole about a paddy from the bottom that even on a 40 acre field and a good well, we were having trouble keeping it watered and have had for years. So this was a good opportunity to try something different. And we'd often have 10, 15 acres of cold water rice. So it was just a tough little 40, even though it's pretty flat. Um, we had the uh, tailwater pump in the corner. We ran initially ox pipe back up the hill, the ox pipe blue, and we had to put, we replaced it with uh, uh, Black Diamond, which did not blow. Um, problems, we didn't get, the, didn't get the pump installed at first pump up, had a little trouble getting it out of the machine shop. Uh, didn't get the flow meter on till later. Uh, we don't have excuses, we're just telling you. Those aren't good excuses, we're just telling you what they are. Um, good rice all the way to the top of the field. We'll see the yield mat in a minute. A lot of times, if you guys have been growing row rice, you know you're pretty weak at the top. Combine loaded up almost instantly. Uh, made 200.3 green, we did weigh it, when, that's a calculated 183 dry. Uh, that's a good yield this year, a lot of, a lot of bad yields. There were, some, there were some hybrid yields that were good and there were, there were several that were not good. There were some variety yields that weren't very good this year either. We're gonna try it again and we're going back to the same field. Um, Chris and I are talking, I think we need a little deeper pool. I don't mean pool around the pump, I mean reservoir, maybe a deeper road to pile the water up a little deeper. He says we're going to go with maybe smaller hole sizes. We're going to talk about that. Algae was a problem due to the thin water and we pumped the reservoir down pretty quick. And by the way, that little pump makes a lot of water. One more thing that interests me. How about a big, big gumbo field with a ton of half-tenth levees? I've got a neighbor who's got a 320 with you know, probably 03 got water running out the bottom all the time. How about one of these pumps in the bottom, not on levy rice, not on furrow rice, but on levy rice, just bring the water halfway back up the field. Don't let it go out the bottom all the time. That's interesting to me. It was hot. We come in and we, uh, we leveled the bottom 100 feet uh, to, to zero, re-leveled it. We shot it to grade. This, uh, this uh, pipe is a perforated on the top like a well screen only in, uh, picture your groundwater well only inverted and uh, we set her in there with a with a boom truck we did have to have three-phase power available and uh, there it is long long time coming and like I said it was hot and it was late and those little mosquitoes were there when we finally got her turned on 
and uh, you can see where we uh, uh, had a, uh, we kind of uh, took the tractor and, and gutted the ditch out to bring it back to the pump, and it looks pretty good, but it does pump down shockingly quick. And you can see the, uh, you can see the water going back uphill back to the top, and we just teed back into the main groundwater line. By the way, we ran polypipe planter, and we ran the smallest hole size that we thought would that would accommodate the groundwater pump. Because you can't afford, I don't see how you can to run two, two sets of polypipe. I don't know how you'd rig that anyway. And you don't want to slow your groundwater pump down. So it's a compromise between this little guy, that'll make up to a thousand gallons. I think we had it on set on 600. Um, so you, you'll end up with the smallest hole size at the top of the field that, uh, that you can get away with. And we're still working on that. And this became a problem right here, guys. It really did. The uh, algae, the scum, the, the guys call it, um, it became a problem and it would stop it up. Um, we're gonna increase that channel size around it. Uh, we're gonna do whatever we have to do so that it doesn't pump the bottom of the field dry so you get a fishbowl effect. That's what you're looking for. You want it to constantly circulate. Here's a little particulars. Uh, first fertilize and irrigation was on June 4th. Uh, we didn't get it set because it was late coming from the fabricator until July 1. Laid the pipe and got it all turned on uh, on July 7th. July 7th, that same day we started to relift, the field was already wet from the groundwater, pump up the field. We thought we would run it for days. We were all, it hurt all our feelings when you can run it a day at the most. We will be working on that, so don't don't give up on us yet. But you guys come here to this uh, to this conference to get reality, and there there it is. We're still working on it. Don't don't get all that's those were really notes for me. Um, we found out that we under the setup we have, we could only run the recovery system 12 to 24 hours before it ran dry. My personal theory is we need deeper water or or uh, or smaller hole size. We're looking for that recirculation effect. At the hole size we had, at 600 gallons, the water flow wouldn't make it back to the pump, up to the top of the field, across the poly pipeline, and back down in time without evaporating. It wouldn't keep the pump resupplied. Okay, you guys with me on that? How deep was your? How deep was it at the bottom? How deep the, the this? It's uh, how how deep is our sump? Yes. Was well, it eight feet, Greg? Yes. Mm -hmm. And what was the diameter of the pipe? Four. 48, eight before, with perforations in the top, and we're two feet below ground level, I think, with our perforations. And when the water is uh, good, as you saw, it looks great. And we had probably on that 37 acres, we probably had 12 or 15 acres. You know, if everything's shut off and it's stagnant, we probably have water backed up 12, 15 acres, which that's that's a lot. That's a lot for uh, for a uh, row water rice. Normal. Sometimes you don't have a couple of acres, and uh, we were. It really hurt our feelings at how quick it pumped it down, and it would go to the top, and it wouldn't. Uh, it wouldn't make it. Wouldn't make it. Uh, wouldn't make it back through. The algae resulted from the same issue. Um, also, you need to know this is not. This is not pretty. Um, Matthew uh, Blake's son. He watered this field, and later in the season, he was actually convinced that it would take more water, because. When he would pump the pool dry, when he would pump the bottom of the field dry, we would have to add more groundwater, okay? So our solution is we're either going to have to stack it up deeper to start with, but we're probably just going to go with smaller hole sizes in the pipe. And you didn't have the pressure compensating valve, so you couldn't use that. Tell me more about that. I forgot that. That, that was the valve that could catch your flow back. We didn't have that in there, so you had about, you, you didn't have that, auto, that automatic. Are we going to be able to put that in? Yeah. Oh, outstanding. Thank you, taxpayers. Thank you. <laughs> it's, uh, also, we killed the algae with copper sulfate. Yes. And that took care of the algae. By the way, anybody, do you, you guys all hear that? You can, you can kill that algae with copper sulfate. Okay, we'll work. That's my words. just needs a deeper pool of water. Uh, the engineer says a wider channel, not a narrow ditch. Um, yeah, we've got, to, we've got to do one or the other. We've got to slow it down so that it has time, so that it doesn't suck the 
bottom of the field dry before it makes it back to the top. And that, after that, this, this system's really going to work. Uh, yield map, the top of the field is up. Uh, if you guys run yield monitor, you know a whole lot of the, of the red is just it takes a minute for the combine to spool up to get a good map. Uh, but we, we had good rice all the way to the top. Okay, where does our farm place row rice? We like to put it, we found, we like to put it in high water use. And we call that anywhere you have to run that pump five and a half to seven days a week. And we do have some of those fields. If your beds are still up, that's where you make money on this. In a minute, I'm going to show you a field where I ran one pass with a, with a Brant Hipper chopper and a planter. That's it. Uh, if it's a loamy field, it's a good bean ground. If you have stacked levees, and if you're planting a hybrid. And by the way, I plant just as much non-hybrid as I do hybrid. But if you're going to do this, in my opinion, it needs to say RT on the front of the number. Uh, where do we put levees? Somewhere we're going to pump two or three days a week. Got gumbo. You don't have beds up, it's rutted up, you're going to have to disc it up anyway. If you're already making good rice, if you're not pumping much water, if you've got contour levees and you're planting tight in your diamond or a big cross slope, if it's working for you, don't be messing with it. Right here, to restate this, we think the money shot in this program is if you've got five and a half to seven days, and really we have some of those, 24 hours a day for two and a half months, and you cut that back to two and a half to three and a half days at a similar yield. Uh, Rondi, I don't know what that adds up to, but it's less. Maybe we're making le we're losing less, whatever, but it's less. Okay, our first field of roll rice. I'm going to show you the picture. All right, pump is pump is here. The rows went to here and stopped here. All the tail water recovers in the levees. So you have half tense levees here, riser here, riser here. So you have rows here, okay? Water them two, three times a week, about 12 hours, okay? Down here, the tail water running here, we have a riser here, and we have multiple inlet across the field. This section ran six and a half to seven days a week for two and a half months. Plus, we had MRI, or MI, multiple inlet, plus, my son was watering it, and he would have to drop the spills each and every week just to get water, plus the tailwater function. This section made eight more bushels. I'll take my minus eight. How about you guys? I think that's a deal. That was our very first row water rise. Okay, how are we doing this to make, using this to make decisions? This is a 40 we have. It's never been in row rise. It pumps six days a week, 24 hours a day for two and a half months. In the future, it's going to be beans, corn, or row rise. That's where we put it. How about this one? This is a good one. <coughs> Gemini 214 Rice Tech, Roberts number six. Had beans on it the previous year. The beds were up, it wasn't rutted. Here's the summary. We cut the beans. One trip with the Brant Hipper Chopper. We planted the rice. We cut 215 bushels per acre. That, this field would have had 13 levees on the 40. The two adjacent fields, which Ronji says I lost $71 an acre on, we're going to argue about that next week. Made 188. Does that work for you? That's the tillage. That's all of it. Now that's not a brand hipper chopper. That's actually the field that made the 188. We run the hipper chopper on the other. It did so good that it broke the stinking auger. You guys ever do that? <laughs> That's a Farm Bureau issue right there. <laughs> okay. Well, what didn't work? Same year, last year, Medlock 62, same soil type, same planter, same combine, same high water use. This one normally takes six and a half, six and a half days a week to pump, but we didn't, Hunter, we didn't plant one that said RT in front of the bag, okay? Look at the yield, 155. Now that's not terrible for Titan, guys. Two adjacent levee fields made 166 and 171, which is about right on the nose for Titan. But you see the, the yield loss, it just was not, uh, it was not competitive. I'm not, I'm not trying to make it competitive versus Rice Tech, I'm just saying it's not competitive versus the, versus the levee fields in the variety. And we have multiple incidents where we've seen that. It just, it just falls further behind. Okay. 
What does it look like, guys, when uh, your guys have a split crown, a wide crown, they get the top too tight, too far apart, and they don't get enough blue gaze? Gentlemen, this is what row rice looks like without, not, this is what non-irrigated row rice looks like. This is between the pipes, and uh, it's right here, okay? So if you want to know what happens on row rice, it looks pretty good all the way to the boot, and then Blake, my cell phone must have been torn up. Nobody told me about this. We'll be discussing this one. But that's what it looks like from the combine. So don't mess it up, guys. Titan, Titan 166, Levy's, Titan 171. We're going to talk about this guy. And Titan uh, 155, and that's, that's this field uh, in row. Okay. Big winding field. This field made 171. Um, for the mess it is, that's pretty doggone good with a variety. But it has, right here in the middle, this 20 acre section is 8 tenths slope, but it's only 330 feet of a run. Okay. Um, I don't think that worked for me. That whole field made 171, including this. I don't even know how bad this is. We, we sprayed the pigweeds two or three times. We spent four of us on a hole, including yours truly in a 100 degree heat index, trying to make the water run for two days for eight, 10 hours a day. So by the way, guys, if you have a little hump in your row rice, you better get it out. You better plow it out or don't put it there because you gotta make it run. But ultimately, the humps weren't the problem. It was too steep. 330 feet, 8 tenths. So if you've got a little mountain that you cannot grow rice on, and by the way, that's even worse than levees, this one may not be your way to do it with the real steep slope and the short run. In my opinion, you just didn't have time to soak up. It was just, that was a failure. Plus, it was a variety, not a hybrid. All right, row rice rule, at least on our farm. I only plant a hybrid. And I, I plant just as much not hybrid as I do hybrid. Uh, small beds, uh, Greg had me, Greg Simpson had me uh, do leave some up that were stale from the previous year, a couple of years ago, and they did just fine. Uh, if your beds look like could somebody could describe them as pitiful or shameful, that's probably what you're looking for. <laughs> don't do 60 inch, don't say I've got 60, it'll do fine, just don't do it. Alright, here's a pitfall. You've got a lot of bean residue in a nice field. You made 60, bush, 60 bushel beans. And you've got to get that Heinecker Ridge Till Cultivator, your WNA, your Brant Hipper Chopper. You've got to get it through those middles because it's got to run. Be very careful. Do not get your bed too big because you won't get it watered on the top. And you'll get a mohawk with it lime green on the top. And by the way, I think it's on down in here. Be sure and desiccate most of the time because you, don't, you do get some uneven maturity. Don't get that bed too big. If you do go back to it with a roller, we run a John Deere 970 color mulcher on it a lot. If there's a hump, uh, I think Bowers up at the state line in Corny, I think he plows his rows out. Uh, don't have humps or you're going to be on that hole. I only plan a hybrid. I think we already said that. Plan on an angle. Um, okay. From my, from my foreman, runs our planters. He says, he said, right? He said, you need to plant those beds fresh and not stale seed bed. We're all into stale seed bed. The reason to plant them fresh is because some of that dirt will cave off as you plant on that angle and it'll fill in some of those seeds on the side of the bed. If you're stale, it won't cave in because that, that soil is kind of hard. Use two residuals at least. I use four shots in. I appreciate that data that Chris was showing that it doesn't really matter. Always, always put contain or agritain on it. Watch out for blast. Don't plant too much of it. Catch all the water you can at the bottom. It's always better at the bottom. Uh, kill those pigweeds. And by the way, on that little short section there that we sprayed the two or three times for the pigweeds, we still pulled the combines over to the side, took battery-powered leaf blowers and blew the millions of seeds off the stripper headers before we moved to the rest of the section. Don't do too steep or too short a run. Uh, try some and watch your plant color. That'll tell you if you're goofing up your water. All right, that's the way we plant it. See that little bitty bed? And we're on 38s, guys, which is probably not the best, but that's where we are. And we plant them on an angle, set that auto steer up, and yes, I see that overlap. 
but set it on an angle and plan on that angle, and that, that seems to work best. All right, here's a split field. How about in the same field? Patty's on, rows on one side and uh, Patty's on the other. The row side was three tenths. Do we have a picture? Yeah. Can you see which side we decided to put the rows on? Over here. We put the ladies over here. Unfortunately, that was tightened and it was minus 21 bushels. And another little tip is don't let your pipe twist in the middle. You want to watch for that. Uh, once again, I mean, I showed you how well the variety can do, I mean, excuse me, the hybrid can do in this environment. The, this, this year, it just, it just didn't do well. See the dark, see the dark green? Leg and tighten, leg and tighten, and you can see the, you can see the fall off. And by the way, here, guys, this is, that's a calibration issue. This was tightened behind tightening. Um, I still plant tighten, but it's not going to be on rows, and it won't be, it won't be consecutive years. All right, guys. Field full of thigh high stack levees doesn't yield as much as a half tenth field does. Even if it does, look at all the money you spend on tillage and fuel and labor and repairs and <clears throat> don't try to compare a three tenths to a one tenth. So when you're looking at this system, don't be comparing your yield on your zero grade and add it in unless the rolls win, which on occasion they do. Anybody have some of this mess like this? Am I the only one with mountains? Well, mountains equal that. We've had to wreck her out for the grain buggy more than once. All right, my crop scout said, don't forget this when you're deciding if you want to do this. What if you only get one day a week or a month, like the last few years, to plant? How about this in northeast Arkansas? Anybody have this this year? See those dates? I'm pretty sure we didn't dry out between the, that rain and the next rain. But that's just a one-year <coughs> phenomenon, right? How about the same date the year before? And by the way, that was a, that was a picture that I sent to the crop insurance company in 2018 when they denied a couple fields of preventive planting. So take pictures, guys. And Blake had sent me a screenshot of the radar that same day, and uh, I submitted them with a letter to the to the uh, from Crop Scout and. Yeah, we had, we had some prevent in 2018 a little bit. How about this? I haven't had this, but our next door neighbor is uh, doing this on the field about a quarter mile away. They're not going to put rows on this, but I just couldn't resist putting this up. And by the way, the green tractor, they don't own that. They stuck, they stuck all the red tractors and went and borrowed the neighbor's green one. <laughs> they got them all stuck. But anyway, some guys are, uh, who, um, who just can't get their levees dried out, they're going to go into the rows. 2018, how about this? 753. These this four four companion fields all in 753. Uh, you can see the levees here, guys, going going to the west. These two fields are rows, following this way and this way. A little bit of problem here. This was a real drought. We had trouble keeping the tops of the beds dry. But overall, you can see uh, uh, the yield was fully competitive. Really nice yield, and uh, this field here would have had about a dozen little levees in it, and uh, made competitive yield what are two or three times instead of six, five or six days a week, and uh, without those levees. This was 2018. All, all but this one is diamond, 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 diamond. This is the only row rice on the field. Has some cut ground issues up here, but uh, as you can see, that was the best diamond on the map. <coughs> And uh, I don't know what I think that's 753. All right, what if you got dropped in a mess by your daddy? This is uh, maybe you've got some mountains, some mud holes like we do. It can help you out with some of these messes. What do you expect? A whole lot less tillage. You're going to plant a lot faster because you're going to throw some, some stuff up early that maybe you couldn't if you had to disc it. You're going to harvest a lot faster. We do skip passes with two combines and run the auto steer, and, and it, it, it works good. Less fuel, less water, less well checking, no spills, no levy plows, no spill boys or girls, no pull the spill out boys, no levy sprays, more yield, less yield. Your daddy's going to be upset because you're doing this because it's stupid. And it can be hard to get the rice straw to burn. By the way, sometimes it's real hard to get the middles to burn. One of my neighbors says it's the easiest that he has to burn. It's definitely our hardest. It's 
it can be tough to get them to burn. So you don't, when you do your first, first row water rice field, guys, don't try to burn it until it's the ideal day. Do not go on a marginal day or you'll be there. You'll be raking it and raking it and raking it. It's awful. It's supposed to look like that when it's over with. And uh, there's my beautiful bride. And remember, thank God for being allowed to farm here in the U.S. Anyway, you guys have any any questions about all this? Okay, back to the beginning, where you're, you're capturing your uh, water at the bottom and pumping it back to the top. Um, <clears throat> My thoughts would be just watch your water level at the bottom and pump less less hours. That's what we had to do. Okay. Ultimately, we had to. It was uh, it it would shockingly small amount of hours, yeah. like seven to many days. Seven to seven wasn't even enough. We're talking about to keep a, a a pool out in the field, maybe four or five. All right. Uh, so the, putting the pump at the bottom end of the field. To Capture your water, pump back up, and just keep recirculating that water. That's a concept, yes. Sir. Um, it's, it's, that to me seems like a lot. That, that's a big expense and a lot of management. I would, if I could, my thoughts would be just to monitor the water until I, uh, you know, this this will take me four hours to get to where that water's going to roll on down to the bottom without. Well, that's what we do. This was just an effort. This was just an effort to. To supply to to reuse the water, okay. Uh, also, they called me with a free project, okay. <laughs> but but the concept, particularly uh, the, the bigger field, a high water use field, would be to conserve groundwater, to put to resupply hot water or warm water back to the top, not cold water. Um, I, I guess those would be the two issues. Okay. Less fuel, less t less fuel, less groundwater, and more warm water and improved yield. It's the same time. So I think what happened was your guy thought, well, we'll pump water down there and then we'll just use it to try to irrigate the next event. There isn't enough water at the bottom to fully irrigate that field again. Mm -hmm. But that's what he was trying to do until we had a discussion. And then we've got to add water and use the pump together, not try to use the water at the bottom to re-irrigate re the whole field. So I don't think we ever we tried to run them both at the same time, did we? Well, we couldn't. We could because we don't have that valve. Yeah. So, he, so yeah. So what we really need to do is start irrigating, shut that off, then let the tailwater pump start picking, and then finish it off. And it took a while. Mm -hmm. You have to change how you're going to do things. The, the bigger the and field. That, that's really one of the challenges. You got to. This is a different way of irrigating. Mm -hmm. You have to adjust to use that pump effectively. Not, you know, we're used to just flooding it back up. Okay, let's go irrigate, flood it back up. This is kind of we're going to as a, as a subsides. Then we need to add some water and let the pump keep going. So it was always it should always be running all the time, and you're just managing the bottom. When it starts to draw down, just add some water to the top and fill back up, and then come back. Then you're not trying to time every three days or four days, or if a rain comes, <laughs> rain's coming, you just don't add water. Rain's going to fill it back up, things like that. So it takes that wind to trigger out of the equation because you're just looking at how much water's at the bottom, how much more do you need. You have a level sensor in that top kit. So the, the pump is variable flow, so as tailwater returns, it only pumps back what comes back to it. Mm -hmm. It's not an on or off pump. It speeds up or slows down based on what's in the bottom. We can watch the flow online and shut it off. Yeah, shut we, it off from yeah, the phone. Yeah, that's right. we put a pump okay. monitor on it. You mm -hmm. can see it. Um, has flow meter on there. It, this is a cool concept. I'm not so sure, uh, even though we did this in furrow irrigated, I'm still not so sure that the money shot might be in a big levee field where you've got a bunch of clay field, clay levees, and it's you know going horizontally through it, and you're you know you've seen them where they're just constantly going out the bottom all year long. I'm not so sure that's not the money. Is and don't try to take it back to the top. Take it halfway back up. It, particularly, let's say you have a side a side uh, underground permanent system, you know, with multiple risers ever so far. Drop it back into that and just play it by ear how far it'll go back up the hill. I, I'm not so sure that's not it. We, uh, we, we irrigate about every three days. We just add a little bit of water and let the pump keep running. And so it all the time. And less than now I say that, yes, that's right. Mm -hmm. I say that, what happens is when you can really tell, and I think you guys saw it too, there's times when that rice is really using water mm -hmm. around the boot stage and we're irrigating about every, almost every day. 
we're adding up. And my guys want to get enough in there on Friday so they come back on Monday. They're not. So that's kind of what they watch that level and just kind of add a little bit as needed and, and kept, kept it going. We don't have to use sensors. We can just look at that. It's a little simpler management than trying to use soil moisture. We do that too, use a soil moisture sensor to try to take a threshold and, and trigger. That's more challenging. Our goal is to keep the top of the bed muddy as possible, as possible up toward the pipe. So where I would look is just about from me to you away from the pipe and tell my guy instead of looking at the bottom or looking at spillways, every time you do it, walk about that far out and see if it's white or if it's muddy. If it's muddy, leave it off. If it's white, turn it on. And, uh, that, but generally two or three times a week. And uh, 24 hours is a long run. What's the cost of this system? Around $15,000. 15? 15. About 30, 30, maybe 30, 40 percent the cost of a tailwater pit. You've talked about the road width. What do you think the optimal road width is? Probably 30. I mean, yeah, we're, we're on 30. We're, we're on 38 and just, sir? It would be. It would be. Um, we, we've got a lot of heavy clay and the tractors in the rice field work much better in the harvest on the, this wasn't a clay field, but we have a lot that are tough, like the, where the guys were stuck, we have that kind of thing. So a 30 inch tractor just doesn't work that well. We've got some 38 inch challengers with the big 38 inch duels and we're 38 by, because of our rice, we're row crop farming because of our rice farming, or our spacing. Do you hold water in other fields, on like the lower third, that's what we've done in our heavy clay? Oh, all I can possibly oh, can, uh, as far as I can possibly hold it. That's what we did. As deep and as far as the rice will tolerate it without hurting it. However, and the, the more we're into this, the more we realize. We can water quicker. Yeah, everything. And it seemed like our lower end of our fields, all of them yielded higher. Yes. Of course, last year was hard like everybody. Like it, yes. We had a perfect plant, but then it just continued. <laughs> and we're seeing that the deep, we're not hurting the bottom of the field like we always thought we would, and we make better rice. And it's just that much less acres that you have to That's have to irrigate. To you just reduced out. your field size. That's what we're trying to figure out on the upper end as far as the fertilizer. How much fertilizer are we using? We aggregating all the side in. Can't ground, of course. And uh, do we lose with the water going down a road? We know to the lower end. You lose some. Because it seemed like our upper end was consultant because our rice tank fell up. said a lot of farmers make higher yield in the upper end. Well, it wasn't that the case with us. No, I've never. Just for a second year. That, I've never so, seen it. I've never seen that ever. Okay. That's at the bottom. I think you've had some pretty good experience with that and some at the top end, right, Mike? You make good yields on the top, Mike? For us, the sweet spot's right there in the middle. Yeah, yeah, in the middle. You got, you got it deep, deeper than normal than you want on the lower end, but that's, I think rice loves to be wet, but not too deep. Yeah. But got that faster. If you can make the whole field, it'll be like the middle. That's, that's our experience. It'd be perfect. Our zero grade, which we, we don't have that much, but where we did plant it, we <coughs> yielded more than the that's what they tried in our area years ago. All the teams going zero grade. It's a big area, but now they work it all back and put the slope to it, you know, that it just never would dry out and harvest or anything you know, else. Curious, so, <laughs> the economic analysis, like compared to putting in a pit and like that water recovery system, have you done like against a do nothing scenario for regular dry rice? Because you're still having to come back and water. Add water to the system every three days, and if you're on a three-day irrigation schedule, so what's the time it takes to make for itself? If you just irrigate traditionally with row rice versus Yeah, we, well, I don't have data to be able to do that. And the idea for doing the economic analysis is so that we can get cost share and percentage payments for NRCS, and we can show that it's more cost effective. Then it allows that to be a new practice to give you a good cost share because the capital improvement. Right, so. Uh, it was like strictly an adoption standpoint. If you just have row rise versus the system, right. which one's more be profitable and how long Well, you have to go back and ask questions. What do you need for the other system to work? And is it as efficient as this? And you're not going to get 9% if you are not if you don't have a pump where you keep it, keep it contained. So you're gonna always going to have, have some tailwater come off there. We'd probably do a better job managing it. We've done a continuous flow. We're still only getting 70% without the pumps. So you're giving something up. It's not... It's not apples and apples.
I would ask, I would encourage everybody, we have a set, a, a round table at the end of the day on the Arkansas uh, Most Crops for Drop Yield Contest. We have all eight winners, I believe, that are going to be there as a panel session that won the contest in corn, soybeans, and rice. So it'll be a Q&A session for them to see what they learned about uh, what they did on their farm. Most of, most of the contestants used fergated rice to try to win that contest. There's only two flooded fields in that contest. So we're going to learn a little bit more about row rice. There's, there's a guy back there. He'll be on that panel. There's some other advice for you as well. So. Thanks, thanks for coming. Thank you.